Most people walking into the theater to see Fantastic Beasts The Secrets of Dumbledore are walking in with low expectations. Understandably so, the first movie built a passable expansion of the wizarding world, the second poisoned that experience with a virus of bad writing, and the franchise seemed on the brink of death. The Secrets of Dumbledore, it seemed, had nothing left to do but read the eulogy. Then along came Steve, or I guess the prodigal son returned. Famous for writing seven of the eight Harry Potter films, Steve Cloves was somewhat distant from the first two Fantastic Beasts movies, serving as an executive producer instead of a writer. After Rawlings' Crimes of Grindelwald script led to the film's comatose performance, however, the story needed reviving, to say the least. Seriously, Crimes of Grindelwald is one of the worst sequels I think any of us have, quite frankly, ever seen. Steve Cloves was clearly the man for the job. The first 25 minutes of The Secrets of Dumbledore are a little clunky, but given all the baggage it has to carry from its predecessor, a slow start is to be expected. What was not expected was the 120 minutes that followed. It was a good movie, genuinely. I would even go as far as to say that it was a really good movie. Against all odds, against all expectations, this film resurrected the Fantastic Beasts franchise with just one central problem. How could the Potter prodigal son Steve Cloves have possibly saved a wizarding world that appeared to be dead on the table? And what's the one big issue that threatens to hold the film back? Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore is... Jesus Christ, dude. What I'm, are you doing? I'm recording right now. What recording hell? what? Uh, my video on Fantastic Beasts 3 and nope. the Secret of Dumbledore. Nope. What? Absolutely not. Oh my god. Dude. Shut up. Fucking muggle. My name is Mason Engel. I am a roommate, a Hufflepuff, and Film Speak's new Wizarding World correspondent. Thank you for that long, unnecessary uh, interruption, but Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore is a really good movie. There, I said it. I'm as surprised as you are. The first movie in this new franchise was only okay, which for the Potterverse, is a failure. J.K. Rowling took what could have been a side plot in Newt Scamander's rounding up of magical beasts in 1920s New York and made it the whole story. Grindelwald appears only in the final 10 minutes, and even then his appearance feels kind of disconnected from the film we've been watching up to that point. Many Potter fans left the theater feeling underwhelmed. Maybe, but the first Fantastic Beast movie wasn't all bad. We get to meet some new characters. Sure, Eddie Redmayne plays the same awkward, doe-eyed character as he does in literally all his movies, but he was compelling, and the rest of the cast was terrific. Tina is an American career woman who embodies a hitherto unportrayed young professional in the wizarding world. Queenie is so big-hearted and pure in her blossoming love for Jacob Kowalski. Jacob, who is one of the most lovable characters in all the Potter films. The cast in this film, plus the broadening of the wizarding world, was enough to keep Potter fans engaged. Yeah, I mean, you know, you might be right, but if Potter fans were engaged after the first Fantastic Beasts, the second one left them shell-shocked with disappointment. Look, The Crimes of Grindelwald simply was written like a novel, and not a very good novel. The setting was varied and random, and we had no chance as an audience to feel grounded in any one place. The plot was so twisted as to overshadow the characters we came to love in the first film, so convoluted Alluded as to require 30 minutes of exposition at the climax. The creators attempted to trade on past Potter goodwill by introducing familiar characters like Nicholas Flamel and Nagini, but Flamel was a parody of the great wizard alluded to in The Sorcerer's Stone, and whenever I saw Nagini, I just thought of Peter Pettigrew milking her snake from later in the original Potter books. And on top of that, she was just a half-baked love interest for Credence. And these issues don't even take into account the franchise's off-screen problems. J.K. Rowling was becoming infamous on Twitter. She is currently infamous on Twitter and even off Twitter. Potter fans had never dealt with that kind of controversy before and they were truthfully very hurt by it. The franchise was dead. The secrets of Dumbledore resurrected it. Really? You think it's possible to come back from the garbage that was that second movie? Buckle up, my muggle friend. 
It is time to plumb Dumbledore's secrets. Resurrection is not only a theme of this chapter of the franchise, it's a theme in the film itself. This is a story of second chances. For years, Albus Dumbledore has been dead inside. He's lived with deep regret over his treatment of his young obscurial sister, Ariana. Cooped up in the small wizarding village of Godric's Hollow, the teenage Dumbledore felt that his brilliance was being stifled. His sister needed tending, but he had grand plans for himself and for his new best mate, Gellert Grindelwald. His lack of compassion for his sister eventually resulted in her death. Now, with the discovery of Credence, the illegitimate obscurial son of Albus's brother, Aberforth, Albus has a second chance. He's determined to show that the arrogant, selfish part of himself has been resurrected as something humble and selfless. He's determined to do for Credence what he failed to do for Ariana. We also see the theme of resurrection in the most important magical beast in the film. The Chillin. The Chillin has a unique ability to give glimpses of the future. This foresight allows it to choose the leader of the wizarding world with the purest of hearts and noblest intentions. Grindelwald hunts a newborn Chillin beast in the Poacher vs. Protector opening of the film. He then uses the beast to predict the next moves of his old pal and new enemy, Dumbledore, causing Dumbledore to construct an unpredictable plan of countersight with Newt and the rest of the team. But Grindelwald has more important plans for the creature. Step one is murder. He slits the Chillin's throat in a horrific scene of animal infanticide. Step two is resurrection. By means of a ritual of dark magic, Grindelwald resurrects the creature and places it under his control. When the Chillin is choosing the next leader of the wizarding world, there is only one possible choice. But the creature's resurrection was born not of love, but of ambition and greed, and so the new life inside the Chillin is not a life at all, and therefore can't survive. This literal resurrection is a perfect contrast to Dumbledore's figurative resurrection. It is, and the film is being released right around Easter. Perfect timing, right? Eh, you, you see what I'm doing? Yeah, okay, all right. There's a second theme in The Secrets of Dumbledore that's closely related to the theme of resurrections. Mirrors and reflections are everywhere in this film. It starts with Credence sending and receiving messages in the fog of his mirror in Grindelwald's headquarters, Nurmengard Castle. Aberforth receives similar messages in the mirror behind the bar in the hog's head. These messages maintain a thread of connection between father and son, while still emphasizing the distance between them. Credence is part of a second kind of mirror magic as well. When Grindelwald sends him to kill Dumbledore, Dumbledore takes their duel to a kind of Doctor Strange mirror dimension. Not only is it a reflection of the Berlin Street, it is also a reflection of the other duel with Dumbledore's obscurial relative, Ariana. Then, with Grindelwald and Godric's Hollow, Dumbledore was dueling to kill and Ariana was trying to stop him. This time, the obscurial Credence is fighting to kill and Dumbledore is seeking peace. It's one step in a mirror maze to redemption. But Dumbledore isn't the only person in that maze. His brother is there too. We learn that Aberforth fell in love with a muggle woman and left her before their son was born. Credence was fatherless, abandoned to the New York orphanage where the obscurus in him would grow. But the stroke of genius in this reveal is in its location. Aberforth sits with Albus in the upstairs room of the Hog's Head. He reveals the past and someone is eavesdropping at the door. This someone is Newt and he enters to offer comfort. Now fast forward several decades when Dumbledore is looking to hire a divination teacher. He meets with Sybil Trelawney in the upstairs room of the Hog's Head. Trelawney reveals the future and someone is eavesdropping at the door. This someone is Severus Snape and he flees to Voldemort with betrayal in his heart. One is a reflection of the other and both are pivotal to their respective stories. Man, that hog's head, that, that hog's head is a very, very important setting. He, uh, Aberforth drums up some business, I'll tell you that much. There's another relationship between main characters that mirrors a relationship Potter fans know well. In the first film, Queenie falls in love with the Danish baking muggle, Jacob Kowalski. In the second film, they suffer a falling out, culminating in Queenie's joining of Grindelwald. In this third film, Queenie lives in the camp of the Dark Wizard while still harboring deep feelings for her old love. Why does this trajectory feel familiar? Who once loved a red-haired girl of muggle birth? Who once lost his old love and joined a Dark Wizard? Who harbored that passion for years and when asked by Albus Dumbledore, after all this time responded simply, always? Snape! Queenie Goldstein is a light reflection of Severus Snape. Her development in the second film is messy and forced, her arc can't hold a candle to Severus's 
at all, but the reconciliation made between her and Jacob in The Secrets of Dumbledore is still powerful. It does make me wonder, though, if J.K. Rowling and Steve Cloves followed this parallel to its natural conclusion, eventually, Queenie could sacrifice herself for Jacob, or maybe vice versa if we're on the topic of mirrors. Let's not get carried away. Once we get to Jacob's character, it's harder to make predictions based on past patterns, because with Jacob, the mirror theme gets shaky. His character is unique in the Potterverse. As a muggle in the wizarding world, now a muggle with a wand, for some reason, Jacob walks a path we've not seen before. He's a baker, sucked into the wizarding world by sheer chance. He could have become enamored with magic, could have sought its power. Instead, he questions whether he belongs in this world at all. Harnessing magic is not his goal. His goal is to win back and rescue Queenie. Despite Jacob's blood status as a muggle, his behavior exemplifies the noblest witch and wizard heroes of the Potterverse. Our favorite Potter characters impose themselves on the world, and they're prepared to take wild risks for the people they love. Jacob is that guy. For Queenie, for Newt, for the whole gang. He and Newt share this trait. Newt, despite the disapproval of the wizarding community, would do anything to protect magical creatures. Together, Newt and Jacob provide a perfect contrast to Dumbledore, who, despite overwhelming power and unmatchable intellect, is characterized by a consistent and frustrating inability to do it. Easy, easy, easy. We'll get to Dumbledore, all right? We will get to Dumbledore. The I film promise. is not just, called The Secrets of Newt. Newt. It's The Secrets of Dumbledore. Let's talk about the man with the beard, damn it. He I, I'm so sorry for this, folks. We're going to have to cut him off a little bit. We'll get to Dumbledore, don't worry. But first, let's talk about Newt. Newt has the action bias of a typical Wizarding World hero. Sometimes. In taking care of his magical creatures, he'll risk life, limb, and the disdain of the entire magical community. He acts. His fight against Grindelwald in these movies is motivated by a desire to stop Grindelwald, sure, but his primary motivation has to do with the creatures with the Obscurus, with Credence. Ever since the death of the Sudanese girl that takes place before the first Fantastic Beasts, Newt has been determined to save Credence from the dark parasite within him. This beast-centered motivation is made more clear by this film's paring down of the magical creature cast. Contrary to the overwhelming quantity of Fantastic Beasts in the first two films, The Secrets of Dumbledore focuses on just a handful of beasts. And they're not just there for spectacle or to give Warner Brothers an excuse to sell toys. Each has a purpose. The Chillin, the Obscurus, the Bowtruckle, the Niffler, they're all as active in the story as their caretaker. Outside of his role as a magizoologist and errand boy of Dumbledore, however, Newt is painfully inactive. His relationship, or lack of a relationship with Tina Goldstein, is case in point. Part of Newt's lack of action in this dynamic can be chalked up to his social awkwardness and inability to read social cues. Indeed, for a character who fans have unanimously agreed agreed to be on the spectrum, it may be unfair to evaluate Newt on the grounds of romantic success, especially when that awkwardness and representation makes him more relatable. But still, it's hard not to draw a parallel between his inaction with Tina to Dumbledore's inaction with Grindelwald. That's what I'm trying to say. Dumbledore could easily have just taken more hey, of the hey, load hey, and- Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, are those status earbuds you got there? Yeah. Have you heard of them? Of course I've heard of them. I don't know if you noticed, but just take a look at my setup here. I'm kind of an early adopter when it comes to new tech, especially when it comes to uh, new audio tech. I really like them. They've been terrific. What's not to like about them? Their audiophile codec stream audio at a much higher quality than most wireless audio signals, and it's packaged into one of the smallest, sleekest earbuds out there? And... The battery life is ridiculous too, especially for something that looks this good. I can get 12 hours of listening just in the earbuds, and then if I put them in the case, that case contains another 36 hours of listening time. Yeah, that's bonkers. I mean, like these earbuds seriously have one of the best battery lives on the market when it comes to Bluetooth wireless headphones, and that's just one piece of Status's cutting edge technology. They're the only Bluetooth true wireless triple driver earbud on the market as well, which means there's a single driver for bass, a single driver for mids, and a single driver for treble. The result is a far cleaner and powerful audio in every range of human hearing. The first time I listened through them, I felt like I was in a movie theater. I'm like, not even kidding. They've been reviewed by tech giants like PC Mag and Tech Radar. I mean, I've used them ever since, and the sound quality has been like magic. Magic. We were talking about Dumbledore. You distracted me. 
And you know what else is great about these Between Pro earbuds? You can adjust the volume with just the swipe of a finger like that. And you don't have to worry about the movement or dislodging of the earbud. They fit snugly and comfortably in your ear. Seriously, guys, you're definitely going to want to get a pair of these Status Between Pro earbuds. They are so great for everyday listening. And if you're interested in the Status Between Pro earbuds, you can definitely get your hands on a pair. Just click the link in the description below. And thank you so much to Status for sponsoring this video. All right, now getting back on track in the world of Newt, because we're still on Newt here, folks. Newt's inaction in this film is limited by one glaring fact. Tina Goldstein is not a main character. At least, she's not written as one. We see her only in photographs and a brief cameo at the end of the film. Whether because she was one of the few actors who spoke out against J.K. Rowling or because Steve Cloves couldn't figure out what to do with her character, Tina was unceremoniously written out. And uh, all I'll say is I hope they find room for her going forward. But in place of her potential romance with Newt, we're treated to Newt's relationship with someone else, his brother. Theseus. This fraternal duo is just as different as Albus and Aberforth, and yet each of them earns the other's respect. We see them work together as a team. More than that, we even see Theseus deferring to his magizoologist brother in a super fun prison escape scene that honestly makes for one of my favorite sequences in a Harry Potter or Fantastic Beast, Wizarding World, whatever you want to call it, my favorite sequences in one of those films ever. Though it's still tied to the magical creatures, Newt's confidence and assertion assertiveness seem to be growing here. Perhaps we're left to believe Tina Goldstein will meet a very different Newt in film number four. Are you going to prematurely talk about Dumbledore's in action, or can I actually trust you to say something of value here that's actually on topic? Jeez, uh, come on. All right, let's hear it. Come on, come on. Thank you. You missed something. Bunty. Newt is as oblivious to her love as he is passive in his expression of love for Tina. There's a strange triangle being developed here that paints Bunty as a hugely sympathetic character. We've all had crushes, or more than that, that have gone unnoticed or unrequited. Newt's in that camp too. It'll be interesting to see if, in the future, he can sympathize with Bunty and their relationship will grow as a result. Can we talk about Dumbledore now? There's one more character that needs to be explored here, and that's the setting. <laughs> For all the shortcomings of the first film, 1920s New York felt like a character. We were introduced to a whole new wizarding community. It felt American. From the hard-nosed cop to the goblin mafia, it was distinct and distinctly magical. In the second film, we bounced around so much and with so little cohesion that it was difficult to ever feel grounded. Now, we jump around in the secrets of Dumbledore too, from Britain to Berlin to the Himalayas, but the places are stitched together by a strong thread of magic. No matter where we are, we know we're in the wizarding world. There's so much fun magic in this movie. It's creative and relevant to the story, and visually stunning, I might add. As a final member of the ensemble cast, the magical world delivers a standout performance. You're talking about magic as a character. You're stalling. Talk about the man whose name is in the title. Talk about Dumbledore. All right, all right, all right, all right, fine. Albus Dumbledore is... He's passive. He's the omnipotent god who watches his underlings squirm in the struggle. It's the same shit he did with Harry. In those stories, JK chalked up his inaction to a desire to let Harry try his strengths. That's why Dumbledore let an 11-year-old risk his life in dungeons with octopus plants and three-headed dogs. Now, we know where Dumbledore gets this trait from himself 50 years earlier but you can't call him passive in this film he devised a plan of countersight to combat grindelwald's prediction of the future with the chillin albus assembled a team to go up against grindelwald right okay sure but the team is far less capable than jude law's dumbledore and yet when albus asked them to risk their lives they say yes with almost no pushback Dumbledore is not acting himself, he's acting by proxy, and he's okay with that. He presumes absolute trust from his followers and seems to have no qualms with sending them to do his dirty work. And his excuse for all of that is the blood 
oath. Is it? I mean, is it an excuse? We learn in the opening scene of the film when Jude Law and Mads Mikkelsen sit down together in a cafe that Albus and Gellert Grindelwald share a bond beyond friendship. As teenagers that summer in Godric's Hollow, they were in love. And per producer David Heyman, that love has survived the passing of time, which makes Grindelwald a much more relatable villain than, say, Voldemort. Listen to what David Heyman had to say here. Grindelwald does still have feelings for Dumbledore, although some of those feelings have turned to resentment and bitterness because of Dumbledore's abandoning of the cause as he would see it. So though Grindelwald will stop at nothing to become head of the wizarding world, beneath that lies a melancholy, a sadness for what he has lost. The one who was his lover, his co-conspirator, and his equal, being the two most brilliant and powerful wizards had brought them together, but the difference in their values tore them apart. Now, despite being surrounded by people, Dumbledore and Grindelwald are alone, and that loneliness is something they have in common. So the blood oath isn't just an excuse, it's a promise. Neither one of them can move against the other. So you can't be mad at Dumbledore for not acting against Grindelwald directly. By definition, he can't. That's the thing though. I'm not mad at Dumbledore. I love his character. Despite his tendency throughout the Potter films to be frustratingly hands-off, his actions are genius and noble. I'm not even mad at Grindelwald. Despite his disgusting ideology, he's still somewhat sympathetic. And if not that, he's at least understandable. I'm not mad at either of these characters. I'm mad at this film's single biggest problem, the Blood Oath. You just said it. Dumbledore was in love with Grindelwald. Part of him still is. Just as each member of the ensemble cast is motivated to action by love, Albus is motivated to inaction by love. Why doesn't he act directly against Grindelwald? Because he loves the guy. Full stop. That's enough of a reason. We don't need a little emo hot topic bracelet enchanted with an unbreakable vow. Albus doesn't attack Gellert directly because Gellert still occupies a special place in Albus's heart. Is it acceptable for Dumbledore's emotions to prevent him stopping the heinous crimes of his old lover? Of course not. But we've all done crazy stuff for the people we care about. We've done desperate things, things we regret. We've acted out of character. Anyone who has ever been truly in love would understand Dumbledore's hesitation to attack the person he loves. That's why I'm pissed off. She invented the Blood Oath as a way to make Dumbledore's inaction airtight. The Blood Oath undermines the core message of this story. Love is messy. It makes us do crazy things. It doesn't make sense and it doesn't have to. Well, I mean, just look at JK's track record. She's kind of become the worst. It wouldn't be far-fetched to think that maybe she thought a straight love would have been powerful enough to explain Dumbledore's inaction, but a gay love doesn't have that same power. It certainly doesn't get the same attention on screen. We never see a kiss. We never see a demonstration of love. It's just talk. When she announced Dumbledore as a gay man following the conclusion of the Potter films, at the time, many were thrilled at the prospect of a prominent gay hero in what was arguably the biggest IP at the time. The problem was, it was all retroactive. There's nothing in the books that even remotely hint at Dumbledore's sexuality in the slightest, and so his coming out by way of J.K. Rowling feels incredibly performative. The films tried their best to weave hints of that into them, but ultimately failed to really leave an impression. Now, with the Fantastic Beasts films, the filmmakers finally finally had a chance to include proper, satisfying, fair representation of Dumbledore as a gay man into their world, and considering how the entire conflict of the film is centered around his romance with Grindelwald, you'd think they'd want to spend time letting us bask in the emotions of that love so the collapse is even more catastrophic. And that's not even considering the fact that LGBTQ plus representation is conspicuously absent in the roles of Dumbledore and Grindelwald. It's a good point, but I would suggest to viewers to watch the film as though the blood oath wasn't there. Dumbledore's actions, or inaction, still make sense without it. He's just a broken guy trying to get whole, and people keep asking him to destroy his other half. Maybe he should have followed his own advice, do what is right, not what is easy. But it is not always easy to know what is right not when you're dealing with love. Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore is a resurrection. A resurrection of skeletons in the Dumbledore's closet. 
of the magic we love in the wizarding world, of the Fantastic Beasts franchise itself. It's a second chance at getting this story right. It goes back to the basic tenets of what makes the Harry Potter films great. It mirrors the through lines of love and loss and redemption. It leads us through a world of stunning magic. Magic spun by the wands of Albus Dumbledore and his disciples and watched by the wide eyes of Jacob Kowalski. It's fun and it's funny and despite its problems, it's given Potter fans hope again. The great train of the Wizarding World is back on the tracks, and it's heading toward the greatest duel of all time, between two men who were once in love and who now must fight to decide the fate of wizard kind. If you're a Potterhead, like my new Wizarding World correspondent over here, this film was made for you, or at least it was made to give you hope in the resurrection of the Wizarding World franchise again. The Chillin' has bowed before David Yates and Steve Cloves, especially Steve Cloves. We're in good hands, as long as they keep those guys captaining the ship.